Our third speaker is uh, Ulaga Sagada from Libya. Let's uh, welcome him. The floor is yours. Great. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ulaga. Everybody calls me Ula. I'm from Drivia. I'm the co-founder of Drivia. We are a consultancy company specialized in data science. Now, I got to say the two previous speakers did a great job, and so I ran out of concepts to talk about. But I'm going to focus on the tools that we have to implement this on the business side. By business, I mean mid-sized companies between, I don't know, 15 to 700 million euros turnover, let's say. So not as big as BBVA, but something that need results and they need them fast. Before doing that, though, whoa. Mm. How does this work? Well, it doesn't. Ah, yeah. Oh, it, the effect was lost. Anyway, um, essentially, when we talk, when we as consultants go to see a client and we talk about the interpretation of, of algorithms, etc., we always assume the next slide. Essentially, there's a lot of talk of you know, um, artificial neural networks versus linear regressions. But what we assume all the time is that from the point of view of the client, everything is a black box. And what I'm going to talk today about is tr let's try to find some tools to reconcile those, those worlds. So who's my client and my point of view, OK? That's why I talk about machine learning deployments as a whole, not algorithms, because machine le learning deployments are much more. Now, this is killing me. OK. So f as a data scientist, when I have a problem in mind, I have to consider three aspects mainly, very simplified, OK? One is, what's the problem at hand? Is it well defined? Can I measure how well I solved my problem? Now, this means that when we talk about interpretation, I'm going to focus on supervised settings. Because unsupervised settings are open for interpretation. And whatever you ask, they give you different opinions. So I'm going to focus on this. Second is, OK, I have the problem well defined. I thought about my algorithm. I implemented it. Hopefully, the algorithm this, does what I, I hope that it does. And then I get some data sets. That's my machine learning that I wish to explain, the entire thing. Now, from the business point of view, they don't care about it. Well, they do care about it, but they don't see it like that. They see it, is it going to solve my problem? Can I trust the predictions that this is producing? Second thing is, can I understand the model? Is it even legal? Is it compliant? They ask us this all the time. And the third, and it's the big elephant in the room, is what's the cost? How much is going to cost me to understand the algorithm? That's why most of the things when we talk about explainability are research. Because when we go onto the private field, there are lots of companies open to that. But this adds a substantial overhead to the deployment of projects. And this is something that we all need to think about, because this is important. Now, more in detail, which tools are there to, to solve those issues? Now, I'm just going to focus on just a few issues, because it's a long list. But essentially, when we talk about impact, is how sure you are about your predictions. Essentially, what happens if the algorithm goes wrong? And this was already introduced, but basically, machine learning has also one big problem. It gives point-like predictions. And you need business people don't work with one point. They work with scenarios. How likely is this scenario? So that's one thing. The second thing is, OK, there's all this research going on, but I need to understand the models in a simplified way. So we need to think about things like natural language descriptors that uh, the, the other speaker talked about, but also familiar intuitive output. I want to play with the model. I want to be able to experiment, because then I understand, then I own it, then I use it. And then finally, as again, cost. Research is fine, but we, we need to package it correctly so people that you know, transfer things can do it in a fast way. Fast way meaning one hour, two hours, three, one day, but not more, at least to understand what's going on. Now, what's out there? I'm just going to focus on a very few tools. My hope is that you live here with a, an idea of the tools and then maybe some motivation to use them. That's all. That's my talk. OK? So first thing I already talked about, uh, point-like predictions. Try to introduce confidence ranges on your tools. And there's three great frameworks to do that, which include Bayesian, Bayesian thinking or Bayesian modeling onto that. And this helps a lot because you can also introduce expert knowledge on your priors. Stan is the most mature one. My preferred one is PyMC. And then the Spyro, which is from Uber. Take a look. Play around. That's great documentation. Now, some people say, no, I don't want to play around. I just want you know, to use it out of the box. 
One option is Facebook profit. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's for time series prediction. And the main point is that it gives you this, which is scenarios. What happens is that, you know, best, best case scenario, worst case scenario. That's what's useful to businesses because then you can translate that to money. Money ranges and then the manager is going to be happy. One example, that's just a stupid example, but essentially imagine you're producing something overbooking on planes. It's fine that you tell me how many seats are going to be occupied, but I need to be able to control the risk of this because if I run into overbooking, then I have a problem. Okay? So first, the impact at uh, confident ranges on your models. Second, the trust. Now, when we talk about trust, lots of things have been said, but essentially I'd like to differentiate. You got a model and there's two kinds of trust. That the model is not biased, it's working correctly more or less, which I will say that's a global interpretation. That's typically on a stage where you're not deploying the model. You're just testing it, making sure everything is fine. That would be a global interpretation. And then there's the local one. Why did I get this prediction for this data point? And this is what most of the users of your products are going to ask. So you need to care about both. Now, I'm just going to briefly talk about two approaches that you know, have made the news lately, Lime and Sharp, because they are useful, but also because they are easy to deploy, easy to understand, and it's quite straightforward to read the papers and implement them. Okay? There's many, many, many more approaches. And I suggest you take a look at the online book by Molnar, which is extremely good for that. Okay? So let's take a look. Uh, we're going to take a real world example. It's a company that's it's membership based. And the thing is, uh, they have members that have online and offline activity, and they eventually leave okay, on a payment basis. Now, you want to be able to call them because there are not a lot of members. But interpretation in this setup means I want to call them to know who to call, but to know what to talk to them about. What's the problem? Why are they leaving? That's why it's important in this framework, the interpretability. But this relates to the business, to the core business of these people. Now, we're going to use Lime and then Sharp. Now, what's Lime? Lime is a nice idea, which is essentially been told already. But essentially, you get a black box model, and you say, I have one instance, so one person for which I'm, it's a local interpretation for which I'm giving my prediction. Then I generate a neighborhood, and this is a fuzzy concept, that's one of the problems of Lime. And I hope that with the interpretable model, linear, separable, etc., a tree, whatever, I'm able to use it as a good proxy for the black box model. Okay? This is great, ah. and it can be specified just a bit like that so you understand. This is a very stupid model. There's the gray guys and the gray guys. Uh, the blue guys and the gray guys. And that's age and that's maybe salary, let's say. And I want to understand the yellow point. So I sample from my space. I weight my samples according to the distance. This is the concept of neighborhood. And then I fit a simple model with the hopes that it's going to work well. Now, this is nice, but it has a problem. What's neighborhood? Neighborhood can mean many, many, many things. And this, in turn, gives a problem with you get two close points, and then you, you get different predictions. So this you need to bear in mind when you try. Try it, and try it with a lot of points, see how it works. OK? Now, how does it work? And this is very important. Lime is very useful because it's very easy to work with. You just pip install, you use it, and it's super, super easy. Now, in this case, I just chose two random examples, but they're no-brainers. This guy is staying. What's pushing him to quit is the amount of money that you pay. And essentially what's pushing him to stay is that he's been with us for a long time. Okay? Now this, the science about that is that I, I can explain it to the guy that's going to call and he can use it. Now this is a bit dangerous, but that's the idea more or less. Now, if you look at the close point, you should get the, the same, right? So I just took Euclidean distances and look at the closest point. And in this case, I got lucky and it's more or less the same, but you see that the the order of the parameters is changing, so it's a bit unstable. That's what I'm, so when you use this, please make sure that you understand what you're doing. Essentially, how you read this is, what's the contribution of my features if I approximate the entire thing with independent features? Which, you know, you need to explain that to a manager, not easy, but you need to make sure they understand what they're doing. So that would be for Lime, and the concept here is just try it out and use it. It's very easy, one hour max. Okay, it's a local approximation. It's a tailored expansion, let's say, of a model. 
Uh, I want to talk about that. That's nice. It's a package called Skater. It's from IBM, and it includes Lime, but many other tools that you can use to make sure your, your, your models are good. I'm mentioning this because it's important for us, which are not researchers, that I'm trying to get things to the private sector, to get tools that you can get rolling fast, because the client cares about this. And if we want to make an impact on the world, we need clients to care about that, and we need to make it easy for them. Now, next iteration. We had a problem with the neighborhood, with Lime, and some very clever guys came up with the SHAP idea. SHAP is based on shapely, shapely values, sorry, which is something that dates back to 1953. But the idea is the same idea of Lime, but instead of using my predictions on my space, I generate a new space called the coalition space. I get a point, which is my instance that I want to predict, and I use the entire data set to generate a new space, which is basically coalitions of the, of the other features. I eliminate features one by one, two by two, et cetera, and I create a new space, and there I get the Shap values, the Shapley values. So essentially, and this is a big overstatement, it's like Lime, plus game theory. And what's nice about this is that it's mathematically sound. So the values that you get, which are the shapely values, they have a mathematical structure which is sound, meaning it has nice decibel properties, like you know, additivity, uh, when, you take, when you add one feature that is it's random, essentially, or it doesn't make any impact, your shapely values don't go up, et cetera. You can take a look at the paper, but, but that's the idea. The bad thing, which is, there's always a downside, is that it's very, very slow because you need to, to explore the entire space, more or less. You need to do permutations of most of the features for generic um, models. But what changed the game is that the guys from SHAP came up with an exact way of computing this for trees. And this is super, super fast. So if you, if you add this to my data set, which was 170,000 rows, it's like one second or two. Or I don't know. Depends. But the idea is it's fast and it's easy to use. But then they also made an effort as researchers to spread the word. And the nice thing is that their, their outputs are very easy to understand. So that's, when I, that's the earlier example. Essentially, what Shab is telling you is it's inverted, but it's the same way. So essentially, that's between 0 and 1, the probability of staying. In this case, it's of leaving. Essentially, what the, on average, the model predicts, because it's balanced, 50%. What's pushing me towards staying? And I get this force plot, it's called which basically balance features. That's easy to understand. It doesn't mean that these features contribute individually, but it means that these features, on average, with the other features, are pushing my predictions on one way or on the other. This is nice because it's easy to understand, it's easy to explain to people, and when people understand what they're doing, they own the models and the, the teams work much better. So this is commendable that people that wrap up algorithms, they also made it easy for us to implement them. Okay? Now, you get more things with that, because, because shapely, sharp value, shapely values sorry, have nice properties. They are local, but they are globally consistent. So you can use them also to understand the entire structure of your model. In Lime, you only got, let's say, points and information about the points. But here I get the information about the points, which is compact, which makes sense with the rest of the data set. So I can use it to explain feature importance, for instance, or to take a look a little bit more on the intricate structure of my data, OK? I just, for the client, but the idea is in here what matters is how much I pay, and if I, I don't know how to say in English, if I domicilio mi factura, because people forget and they just get charged all the time, you know? But that's the idea, OK? Nice part here is that there's a lot, a lot more things you can do. There's higher order interactions you can, you can evaluate, and also the same guys that did SHAP, for trees, they are adapting it to other models because it's a framework. So you can use it with deep learning models in some cases, okay? But just take a look at the website. It's a Python package, R package, you can use it. It's easy. And it's easy also to convince your managers to let you use it. So this is just a really quick overcap recap of what's out there, but I just don't want to end my talk without saying to you and, and you know, emphasizing that this is the element, like we need to, to solve this. Like there's a lot of research being done and it's great, but we need to push this onto society. And to do that, we need good engineering on the code. We need easy to understand documentation, which is not a paper, it's something else. As an example, go to UMAP, for instance, which is an embedding 
they have a great explanation of how the algorithm works. And also, and this is very important, we need acceptable UX so the users, which are not technical, can play around with the algorithm, can change things and understand. Because we humans, we understand by example and by testing. Okay? So just to conclude. Well, ah, okay. So again, there's tools out there. They're getting mature. We need to make sure that we use them. If you like them also and you use them, please contribute back with PRs onto, because it's open source. But essentially, the tools are not enough. As a technical people, we need to think in terms of business, which means how is it going to impact my client? How can I make my client trust my algorithm and reduce the costs of implementation? Otherwise, it's always going to be proof of concept. It's not going to be go on to the world, and we cannot fight things like bias, discrimination, etc. Last but not least, that something is easy to implement, it doesn't mean it should be implemented. So don't forget that data science is not data magic. Meaning that please, when, make sure that when you transfer those, you transfer it to the appropriate people that know what they're doing and that understand what the algorithm can do, but most importantly, what the algorithm cannot do. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, we're running a little bit late, so we have time for one quick question for Hula. Is there any question? Um, okay, so uh, I think we can uh, uh, close the session uh, here. Thank you very much for attending. The next session is starting uh, uh, right now, and uh, so Lali should be around.